In Uruguay, education sector staff conducts a 48-hour strike to protest budget cuts and the educational reform promoted by the government. In Argentina, the 23rd meeting of select foreign ministers addresses the current challenges facing the region. And in Iran, the Daesh terrorist groups claims responsibility for the terrorist attack against the sacred mausoleum Shah Sirak that left 15 people dead. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. In Uruguay, the Teachers Union is holding a 48-hour strike in rejection of the education reform being promoted by the government of President Luis Lacalle Pou. The strike began at 10 o'clock in the morning, local time, at the premises of the skating club in Montevideo. The coordinator of the teaching unions called the action, which was joined by the Elementary Teachers Federation, Secondary School Teachers, and the Union of the Labor University. The act is in defense of the public education and against the historic adjustment of $150 million. The mobilized people also reject the stigmatization of the teachers collectives, which in the last few weeks have kept out several protest actions. In Bolivia, in response to the Civic Committee's destabilizing actions, several social organizations proceed with a siege of Santa Cruz as a pressure measure to lift the indefinite strike. The Single Union Federation of Indigenous Workers of Santa Cruz reported that the siege of to the capital of Santa Cruz is a measure to the strike launched on Saturday by the civic committees. The strike is causing direct impacts on social sectors and also affecting services such as transportation and health. Several unions point out, among other aspects, that the siege seeks to demand from the civic leaders led by Fernando Camacho to have allowed the business sector to distribute their production excluding farmers who have refused to provide the people with their merchandise. The Union Federation assured that as of this Wednesday, only ambulances will be allowed to pass through the blockade points. Earlier, several confrontations left at least two people injured in the town of Plan Tres Mil as part of the ongoing dispute between those who demand the lifting of the blockades and the supporters of the civic committees who insist on continuing the blockade as a pressure measure against the government of Luis Arce Catacora. Santa Cruz police arrived on the scene to de-escalate the situation and used tear gas to disperse demonstrations. Also in Bolivia, rural women's organizations denounce having received their threats from former opposition groups that maintain destabilizing actions in the Santa Cruz Department. The Secretary of the Federation of Indigenous Farmers Women of Santa Cruz, Bartolina Sisa, Felipa Yalili Montenegro, denounced that she and her family, as well as several other leaders of this organization, were threatened and warned that their lives are in danger. The leader pointed out that recently a family member was murdered and that she warned that the aggressors want to do the same to her. Felipa Yalili called on the national government, as well as the international community, to reflect on this situation and pointed out that the governor of Santa Cruz, Fernando Camacho, and the civic committees are persecuting and harassing the social organizations. In the same context, Felipa Montenegro stated that for the past nine days, the civic committees attacked members of the Federation of Rural Women. The social organizations, both organized and unorganized social sectors of civil society, are being threatened. They threaten me several times. They are constantly harassing our courageous federation, where we are all women. You can perceive leaders. We are here entrenched for any occasion because they have already tried in the last nine days. They attacked us. They have done what they wanted. They kicked us. But now they already want to kill us. 
The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, led a meeting presenting an economic balance together with ministers of food production. On Wednesday, the president announced the country's economic congress and the progress also, where he assured that the year 2022 was a year of expansion, growth, and the creation of the post-oil economy. In this meeting, the Minister of Agricultural Production and Lands, Wilmar Castro Soteldo, informed that 11,145,000 tons of food have been produced, of which 7,800,000 corresponds to the vegetable sector and 3,342,000 to the animal sector. Likewise, the minister highlighted that 514,299 hectares of corn were planted in the national territory. In this sense, the head of state made a call to all the sectors of the country to work, articulation and permanent production. Now we move on to other topics. On Wednesday, Brazil's working class housing movements took to the streets to demand an extension to a temporary ban on evictions that is due to expire on Monday, one day after the presidential elections. From Sao Paulo, our correspondent Brian Mia reports. In cities across Brazil today, thousands of activists from the housing movements came to the streets to demand that the government continues an order blocking evictions that is scheduled to be lifted the day after the October 30th presidential elections that could leave over one million people homeless. The victory that we achieved of freezing evictions during the pandemic was very important. But we want to transform this into a national policy that doesn't permit city governments to order evictions, requiring them to provide social housing instead. In a country with a deficit of over 6 million units of dignified housing, the Bolsonaro administration has been a disaster. It cut the social housing budget by over 90%, vetoed a law that would have enabled renters to avoid eviction by negotiating their debt with their landlords. And at a moment when 77% of Brazilian families are in debt, it's trying to pass through a law that would give banks the right to confiscate the houses of debtors. If it depended on Bolsonaro, everyone would be homeless or dead because Bolsonaro doesn't like the people from the favelas and he doesn't like the homeless people. He hates people who fight for housing rights and hasn't enacted any type of social housing policy in the cities or in the countryside. He hasn't enacted agrarian reform and won't enact urban reform either. The housing movements hope that Lula is elected this Sunday and that after taking office he restores all of the social housing policies that were eliminated after the 2016 coup. Brian Mir, tell us sir, São Paulo. We'll take a short break, but first remember you can follow us on our TikTok account at Telesur English in which you will be able to see news in different formats, news updates and more. Other stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. In Argentina, foreign ministers of the countries of the community of Latin American and Caribbean states meet to address the current challenges facing the region. Among the topics to be discussed during the 23rd meeting of select foreign ministers are the past pandemic economic recovery, the anti-corruption agenda, and dialogue with extra regional partners, among other matters of regional interest. The aim is also to renew the strategic association based on historical, cultural, and human ties, and in order to strengthen the different cooperation ties between member countries, so that relations can reach their full potential. In Argentina, in the framework of the 39th meeting of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, Foreign Minister Santiago Cafiero said that the countries of the region have the tools to overcome the current crisis. 
Cafiero pointed out on the closing day of the meeting held at the Kirchner Cultural Center in the city of Buenos Aires that the member countries have the capacity to recover from the aftermath of the pandemic and the global energy crisis. He also highlighted the efforts of the Organization for the Transformation of the Development Model of the Region. Meanwhile, valued the roadmap proposed by the organization, which in his opinion is not limited to describing the situation, but also presents proposals and initiatives to overcome the crisis. Also in the framework of the 39th meeting of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, Cuba's Minister of Foreign Trade denounced the economic, financial and commercial U.S. blockade imposed against the island during the last 60 years. In this context, we cannot fail to denounce the interventionist stances and unilateral coercive measures of some states that violate the sovereignty of other countries. Especially, we demand the end of the economic, commercial, and financial blockade imposed by the government of the United States of America against our country for more than 60 years in flagrant violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. The interventionist position of this government against Cuba has only intensified over time with the implementation of the Helms Burton Extraterritoriality Law and the arbitrary inclusion of Cuba in the list of countries that sponsor terrorism. Venezuela's Foreign Minister Carlos Faria underlined the adversities faced by Venezuela during the COVID-19 pandemic as a result of the illegal sanctions imposed by the United States. The COVID-19 pandemic taught us lessons that we should consider. At the beginning of the pandemic, Venezuela was the target of strong attacks. The disastrous unilateral coercive measures against my country prevented the purchase of vaccines, medical equipment, and other medicines necessary to curb the pandemic. And later, after great efforts and thanks to friendly countries, we broke the blockade. Now we'll move on to other topics. The meeting of, with heads of the intelligence agencies of the members of the Commonwealth of Independent States served as a stage for Russian President Vladimir Putin to warn that the U.S. uses Ukraine as a battering ram to stir up confrontation in the region. Russian President Vladimir Putin claimed that the United States is using Ukraine as a battering ram against Moscow. He added that the same practices applied against the Russian Belarusian Union states, the members of the Organization of the Collective Security Treaty, and the Community of Independent States. Ukraine became an instrument of the United States foreign policy. In fact, the country has lost its sovereignty and is directly controlled by the United States. which uses it as a battering ram against Russia. Almost immediately, the Ukrainian territory became a testing ground for military biological experiments. And now they are pumping out weapons, including heavy ones, and ignoring the Kiev regime's statement about the desire to obtain nuclear weapons. The Russian head of state in a video conference meeting with the heads of the intelligence agencies of the members of the community of independent states also warned that the illegal arms market represents a serious challenge as cross-border criminal groups are actively involved in arms smuggling. The black market for weapons in Ukraine represents a serious challenge. Cross-border criminal groups are actively involved in smuggling them to other regions. It is not just small weapons. There are still risks of more powerful weapons falling into the hands of criminals, including manned portable air defense systems and high-precision weapons. At the same time, at the meeting, Putin also insisted on how the West is undermining global energy stability. 
Some participants in international communication are trying at all costs to maintain their unstable hegemony. They do not even shy away from direct sabotage. I'm referring to the organization of explosions on international gas pipelines in the North Stream. In fact, we're talking about the destruction of a pan-European energy infrastructure. And this is done despite the fact that they cause enormous damage to the European economy, significantly worsen the living conditions of millions of people, and in fact, they keep quiet about who did it, in a very convenient way, I would say. The Russian president called for joint work within the community of independent states in the face of the potential for conflict in the world as a whole, as well as at the regional level, which remains very high. He argued that new risks and challenges to collective security are emerging. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. In Iran, the Daesh terrorist group claims responsibility for the terrorist attack against the sacred mausoleum, Shah Shirak, in the city of Shiraz in the southwest of the country. The attack took place on Wednesday, causing the death of 15 people and wounding at least 40 others. In turn, local media reported that the attack was provoked by a man armed with an assault rifle who used it against the worshippers who were in the sanctuary. The Iranian president, Syed Ibrahim Raisi, condemned the terrorist attack and promised that he will give an exemplary response to the perpetrators. On Wednesday, China responded to warnings by the U.S., Japan, and South Korea on a potential nuclear bomb testing by North Korea. Relevant sites will face up to the root cases and details of a long-standing stalemate of the Korean Peninsula and do some things that will enhance mutual trust and resolve the concerns of all parties in a balanced manner. In the same line, the diplomat urged the U.S. to abandon the China threat policy. It's a partner and a source of opportunity for the development of all countries, not a challenge or a threat. We urge the United States to abandon its zero-sum thinking and keep up with the times, instead of spreading its outdated China threat theory and piecing together a small clique with no future. It should try to establish a new mindset of openness, inclusiveness and win-win cooperation and do more to promote world peace and development. Now we move on to other topics. In Tanzania, firefighters continue their efforts to extinguish a forest fire, consuming the lush forest on the slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. Africa's highest peak started to catch fire on Friday night, and although it was under control, the fire spread to the south face of the peak. Authorities had previously thought that the fire on the famous peak could be brought south under control, but it climbed to some 4,000 meters up the mountain. Although strong winds fanned the fire, a team of 400 people among them students and volunteers fought to contain the flames. In Egypt, heavy thunderstorms and hailstones have caused flooding in the streets of Cairo and other provinces of the nation. In the city, in which the inhabitants usually have more than 200 sunny days per year, the traffic was being interrupted by the continuous rains and the floods that it has caused. The meteorological authorities warned that the next days will be of unstable weather conditions in the whole country. The Ministry of Irrigation of Egypt informed that it was ready to deal with the heavy thunderstorms and the consequences that this one will live.
and the levels of the most common and dangerous greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide, nitrous dioxide, and methane, increased to record levels, according to the World Meteorological Organization, WMO. Of the three main types of greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, the biggest jump between 2020 and 2021 was in methane. Its concentrations in the air come with the biggest year-on-year -year increase since regular measurements began four decades ago, according to the WMO. Methane is more potent at trapping heat at carbon dioxide, but doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide, and there is 200 times more carbon dioxide in the air than methane. Three-fifths of the methane we produce comes from livestock, rice farming, the use of fossil fuels, and biomass burning in landfills. The rest comes from natural sources like wetlands and termites. We have come to the end of this news brief, but remember you can find this and many other stories on our website at teleswithenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Teleswith English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.